I love you. Yeah. <laughs> What's that, Manchu? I love your little introductions to this humor. <laughs> okay. I'm good. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I have to tell you how excited I am. Um, we never, we never <clears throat> Sharon and I have talked about doing this for years, and we've never done it. <clears throat> We're actually having a reunion with the guys I worked with, the re all the retirees in Banff, uh, the next three days. And I'm so thrilled. These, we, we had such a bond, and we had so darn much fun with each other. I was tempted to show you a couple of the videos we made at some of our faculty meetings. They were uh, a little absurd. <laughs> anyway, we just had so much fun. So I can't wait to see these guys. It's going to be really good. So that's that's why I had to uh, shuffle some classes this week. So <clears throat> quick review where we've been. I hope I, I, I'm doing this because I want you to see I'm, I kind of have a logical sequence of thought uh, tied to what we're doing in these six weeks. We talked initially about visualization, the brain, the eye, the hand uh, all need to be one, right? Talked about the importance of, of the drawing, the values, the colors, all of that pre-thought. We looked at some compositional uh, principles, you know, uh, rule of thirds, rule of odds, rule of space, simplification, geometry, and symmetry. And today, today I want to talk about applying paint. Okay. So there's, you know, there's a symbolic um, thing that's happened here. <laughs> it's taken us four lessons to get to picking up the paintbrush, right? <laughs> and uh, symbolically, that's the way a painting happens, right? There should be a whole lot of stuff happening before your brush gets wet. So we're finally there. I'm going to talk about applying paint. So as we go today, um, I'm going to be asking for your insights. I want you to share as much as as I want to share, because uh, each of us has different experiences and we can all uh, learn from our, our collective uh, experience. I'd especially ask Karen and Pauline, who are fairly new to our group, if they could share a couple of things that they've been doing. So uh, please, you two girls, interject at any time, okay? And we'll, we'll uh, uh, love to hear what we have to say. So um, as those of you who are in my last session, <clears throat> we spent some time looking at this with brushes. Um, I don't know, do you have any questions or things you want to talk about brushes? Maybe I should just review real quick. The types of brushes, your squirrel hair mop brushes. They have the large body, hold lots of water. Kalinsky Sable, they spring back into shape, much different than these do. They don't quite spring back. These do spring back. <laughs> They're more expensive. <clears throat> Sable Synthetic are good, but as you know, you lose the tip. Uh, synthetic brushes, <clears throat> Are, are good, but they don't hold a lot of water, hold hold less water than, uh, and hold less color than natural hair. And then your flat brushes, which of course you can get different sorts of, uh, of uh, lines, et cetera. Do you have any comments or does anybody have any wonderful brushes you found that are just like the, the ultimate brush? Eileen? Yes. What have you found? Michael Solovyev's brushes. And I know you love them too. God, they're my go-to. I don't don't seem to use anything anymore. Me too. I'm yeah, I got them all, and it's like I want I want to buy more, but I don't need them because my points are staying. Yep. And the black ones, the Escada, 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 whatever, uh, the points are staying. I can actually do a little dot on an a, a pupil of an eye with my big fat brush because the point is so good. Mm -hmm. It's amazingly good. Yeah. Yeah, no, and the other, whatever those funny brushes are called, I recommend them to anybody. Like They're fantastic brushes. Yeah, I've never found a brush equivalent of, of this uh, Michael Salavia. I mm -hmm. totally agree, yeah. You know, do you know if his, I've ordered some, I'm just waiting for them to come. I think it's goat. I think inside it's wolf, and then the white is goat. And I, I bought this brush, it's my favorite brush. I bought it probably 15 years ago, and it was $3. And I have never been able to find the guy that sold them. It was this this um, wonderful Chinese brush painter, and he sold them out of a suitcase. And he left Oakville, so of course I've never tracked him down. But um, I think it's similar to Michael's. It's empty, so it's hollow, so the air can go in, and that helps for uh, dry brushing and also keeps it from... I think rotting so far I've only glued it twice and so far it's holding out but I'm hoping when Michael's brushes get here it's similar it, it sure looks as similar it it probably is similar Michael's brushes Michael uh, 
was on an international trip and, and bumped into a fellow artist from China who was using these brushes and Michael got the source contact, which was a fellow in China who makes the brushes. So they're of um, Chinese uh, inspiration or manufacture. Oh, wonderful. So yeah, I think just the goat and the wolf combination, the go goat's a little bit um, firmer, so it holds the shape. And mm. the, the brown hair or the red hair inside is softer, so it holds the paint. And it's just the most magical combination. So I'll have to stop painting if this brush ever, <laughs> ever, ever dies. So and you've got 15 there. years out of that, huh? Yeah, so far. Like I said, I've glued it twice and it has a lot less goat hair on the outside now, but uh, it's holding on. That's true. That, that sounds just like Michael Sol how Michael Solovyev was describing one of his brushes too. And I also have all of his brushes and that's the only thing I use as well now. <laughs> so great. They're, they're great. I'm actually just at the point where I'm starting to notice uh, the difference in brushes and, and um, so I, I'm it's not quite to you guys to where you guys are yet in terms of knowing you know the you know the inherent qualities of all the brushes, but so this is really interesting for me to hear, uh, um, you know, to get some ideas about uh, where to go in terms of uh, a direction for brushes. And you can buy those online, David. Yeah, yeah. D David, definitely consider taking Michael Solovyev's uh, workshop in August. I, I'm taking it again. It's, yeah. uh, it's boy, full. Boy, he pushes it's, you hard. It, it's full. Oh, poop. <laughs> so it's waitlist only for Michael. Uh, well, so. there I go again, missing that. <laughs> Put me on the waitlist. I'll let you know. Okay, let, let, let me know anybody who's interested, but it is waitlist only. <laughs> so Kai, I think I, I, I need to express a collective thank you to you for bringing Michael in because because so many of us are, you know, it's become our one and only, and it's because you brought him in. So thank you. We <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome. It's uh, radically changed everything for me. So that's yeah. great. That's great. I'm glad. Yeah, <laughs> we are too. <laughs> Sorry, so I cut someone off. I didn't mean to. No. Well, I, was, okay. yeah, I was just going to say that uh, I use Michael's brushes as well, and I love them. Um, and, and this is the little one that I use most of the time. And I know you asked me uh, this week to let you know how I do the softening um, on some of my subjects. And I did use this brush. But I, I do want to say also that before I, I had <laughs> access to Michael Solovyev's brush, I had found a really good brush that did similar um, a similar effect that I liked. And uh, it's a very cheap, simple little brush. Here it is. It's a Royal Lang Nicol brush, Zen, and it's extremely cheap on the cheap end, but it's also a goat hair brush. And it has that really, um, I don't know if you can see that on my camera here. It's like, it's just a little, it's kind of, they, they classify it as a mop, but it, it's, when I look at what you have up here um, in terms of mops, this doesn't doesn't really fall into that category that I see on your screen. It it really helps to uh, brush into other areas like wet paint into dry paint in a very soft um, uh, way that doesn't leave any lines. So if you're looking for something like that, which is very similar to the effect that Michael's brushes do, this is a really good cheap alternative to try. They sell this pretty much everywhere. What's it called again, Colleen? It's it's called a Royal uh, and Lang Nickel. That's the brand, Royal and Lang Nickel. And the brush itself is a it's called a Zen half inch. Okay, thank you. It's a little mop. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions about brushes? I think we all started kind of not knowing what was going on when it came to brushes, but with time, we find that there's some that we sure love. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there's the other 500 that we bought thinking they might do the trick. <laughs> yeah, <how> true. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or all the ones who've lost their point, too. <laughs> uh, let's have a look at, um, oh, paints. Um, 
I think most of us are, are Daniel Smith, Windsor, uh, Newton are probably are fairly much the go-to. Does anybody use anything different? Uh, I, we have used American Journey for many years and we still have American Journey. But if I was making a recommend, so, I mean, it's perfectly acceptable and it still sneaks in. But if I was to make a recommendation, it would be to, uh, and going forward, it will be Daniel Smith. And I, I can't even honestly tell you why. I just find the paint is so reliable and consistent. And uh, Michael Soloviev makes this claim, which I couldn't believe that even the stainers in uh, Daniel Smith can be lifted. But having taken his workshops, it's true, they can be lifted. So there's a versatility with the Daniel Smith brand that you don't have with some of the others. Thank so, you. Yeah. I like Sennelier as well. Which kind? Sennelier, it has honey as one of the binders. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, I find some of their colors to be really, really luminous. I mean, of course, Daniel Smith and Windsor are fabulous, but um, Sennelier is great too. And M. Graham is also a honey uh, base mm -hmm. paint. And I used, uh, I used to love it. And um, I ran into a few little problems and I'm not sure if it was related to my environment because we're on a well and so our water's filtered and ends up having more salt in it. Um, also, I paint in the basement and it gets really cold in the winter. So my art room where my paints sit would actually get so cold and dry that I, I'm thinking it just maybe some sort of chemical reaction with everything else. Anyways. Bottom line is I started not liking them very much. And like Kai said, I navigated to Daniel Smith and, and I'm pretty much still 100% satisfied with everything I bought from him, from that company. Awesome. They certainly have great colors, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love their funny mixtures. Yeah. The moon glow and undersea green. They're... Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Yeah, they do have some really cool companies. Yeah, there's a German German company, Schminke. They make um, a line of of uh, super granulating paints that are really interesting. I've, I've used a couple of those. What's yeah, the name of it? Really expensive. <laughs> yeah, they're expensive. Yeah, Schminke. Schminke? Okay. Schminke. Schminke. Yeah, uh, Desserts carries those. And then yeah. in Alberta, there's a really Delta Art. I think oh. carries them. Delta yeah, Arts is a really good supplier. Yeah. yeah, you can get some good deals on Delta. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, all of you have different, you know, colors in your palette. Just for interest sake, here's what I've got in mind. I'm not even quite sure how we ended up with all of these similar uh, Siennas, but. Uh, I like them. <laughs> and I'm finding I really like Quinn Sienna and Paraline Violet are becoming a couple of favorite colors. Anyway, there's what there's what mine is. What, what anybody have anything different that kind of a standard thing you use? I have to I have to inter <laughs> intervene. This is so funny because uh, Quinn Sienna and Paraline Violet are two of the paints that are in Michael Solovyev's palette. Wow. And, <laughs> and and I have now gravitated towards using the same very limited palette that yeah. Michael Solovyev is using. So there are only uh, nine, uh, I think it's nine paints altogether. You yeah. can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, there's only nine paints in his palette that he uses and, and uh, they're wonderful. Now, occasionally he uses Moon Glow as well and uh, a few odd ones but the majority of the time almost all of his paintings are stem from um this mix of or singular use of these nine um nine paints that he has and if anybody wants more information about those actual colors just send me an email i'm happy to let you know perfect yeah, thanks yeah also indigo is a big uh uh, I know it's in Michael's palette as well, and I always used indigo, and it, it really helps to create a lot of darks for me. Um, it's a go-to for me as well. Yeah. I don't know which one you use for that kind of purpose, um, Brian. Yeah, I, I'm personally, I, I haven't really used much indigo. I had it for a while, but I didn't find I used it very much. 
What would you use to deepen a color, for example, like a red? Um, uh, well, that's why I've got neutral tint, moon glow, and sepia. Okay. Sepia is more of a warm one. Moon glow is a little bit more of a cool, and neutral is kind of nice and neutral. <laughs> Perfect. So I use those three. But we'll, we'll talk about some of those color mixes in a minute here. Anyone else have any go to color that, that you want to share? I like uh, Holbein's lavender, just as a block. It's it's an opaque color, but um, it works really well. A lot of these colors are racehorses. They move really fast. If you need to slow it down, you can use an opaque color like um, yellow ochre or um, lavender. And and so I have both of those, and I use them for that. I noticed in that watercolor live how many artists are using lavender. Mm. That's a pretty common color for them. Okay, thanks. So, um, uh, paper. Now, you know, I'm I, pretty obvious I'm an Arches fan. Anybody else have any favorite paper? Moulin de Roy. What's that called again? Moulin de Roy. It's uh, a paper that's softer, so it lifts really well. Arches is a workhorse. It's a great paper, of course, but... Uh, Moulin de Roy is, um, it's great for if you're going to do a lot of lifting techniques. Okay. Mm -hmm. You must have had to order that online, eh? I did. I ordered it from Jackson's. Uh-huh. Karen, that's great, really interesting. How do you spell that? Is that M-O-U-L-I-N? Yes. And then I think it's D-U or D-E and then Roy. It's R. Oh, R O I, or it could be R O Y. I've seen it spelled both ways. Yeah, so Moulin de Rouet, for those of you who are francophone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, <I got> you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. And it, it's a what, what does it come in 140, 300? It's 140. Uh, you can get it in, um, it's bright white. And uh, every once in a while they have it on sale. So I ordered, I think a month ago, 100 sheets. They okay. were on for five dollars a sheet. What? Mm -hmm. okay. So with shipping and duties, it was five seventy eight. But still, that's like such a great deal. Yeah, what size works. sheet are you talking about? Uh, Thirty by twenty two. And where does where did, did you order it from? From Jackson's. Jackson's, in which is in England. Yes. Okay. All right. Hi, uh, Kathy McDenley. She orders from there often as well. Yeah, yeah and so she do I. That often the prices are far superior than what we find here in Canada or even in the U.S. Even with with the, the shipping and whatever, just don't mm -hmm. go crazy because customs will definitely catch you then. Yeah, their sales are great, but right. watch for those. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. 300 time. pound arches is my go to. I, I really can't stand the wibbly wobbly. And I always put my 140 pound paper down wrong. So I've given up. I just love my 300 pound. And I can really abuse my paper that way. Yep. And from my paintings, I'm sure you can see I'm mean. I'm really rough to my <laughs> paper. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you. That's really good to know. <laughs> Um, do you have any favorite color mixes that you like to use? I think there's a lot of standard ones that we all kind of go to ones, but do you have any favorites that are really kind of? I like um, purpley ones with the blue. No, I don't think so. But you know what I've discovered? That I must have favorites because if, I, and the reason I discovered this again is all of the paintings that are going in the show they all kind of have the same color palette, even though the subject is different. I'm going, how did I do that? So I must have some favorites that are unconscious in me that I keep going, gravitating to. And I think subconsciously, probably all of us do that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I was sticking to uh, three colors for the longest time. And uh, I've navigated a little bit away from that. It was, it's really weird because it seemed to work very well. So it was Prussian blue, um, naphtal or pearl red, either one of those two, pretty much the same, just by different manufacturers. And then a Hansa yellow light or medium. Again, you can navigate again, 
uh, with a, a slightly different yellow. But those three basic colors and with the Prussian, especially for um, the kind of paintings that I was doing, which is, I guess, for, for a while, I was really into the landscapes and the uh, floral and stuff. I really went to those three basic colors a lot. And I see a lot of my paintings today now, you know, from what I've painted uh, with that same color mix. It's interesting because it really creates a lot of variety of colors. It's amazing. Yeah. So what have you added to it? What did I add it to? No, what have you added to it? You said you've gone beyond that a little bit. What have you? Oh, added? so so what I've explored is uh, using three different, um, like as a triad, three different colors. So phthalo. I know Michael Solovia really likes phthalo blue, and uh, I sort of like it as well. But it's it's quite vibrant, and and I'm still trying to get accustomed to it. So I've I've switched over to uh, different blues, yellows, and reds, and and certainly when I do uh, portraits and stuff, I. I'll switch that up again even more. I'll, I'll change some of the colors that I use. But for landscape and nature, um, I still go to the navigate to those. And sometimes also adding a little bit of purple, like um, cobalt blue violet is really a nice color. Cool, thank you. Thank you, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I wanna show you, um, I, like I've, I've told you all the way along here, I'm, I'm currently in the course with Paul Talbot Greaves. I want to show you his color mixes because even though the course is about brushes, uh, right from the first one, <laughs> I've been just as the word is gobsmacked <laughs> at his color mixes because he does things that I never dreamed I would ever even try. So, so this is his. This is on the very first class. This is his demo, and <clears throat> for his sky, mixes sap green, Windsor violet, and white gouache. Mm. Uh, to me, right away, I was like, what? What are you thinking? <laughs> right? Mud. It's just that's just not what you normally would ever think you'd do, right? So then this this hillside, he did yellow ochre, Windsor violet, and white. And again, he's using this white gouache mixing in. So he doesn't he doesn't get too caught up in worrying about transparency. He does a lot of opaque colors thrown in here. And and again, the white gouache immediately um, opaques it, right? His green is sap green and cadmium red. Isn't that a fascinating cho choice of colors to put in? And again, I would never dream of throwing cadmium red into things, but, but you'll see as we go here that he, that's a go-to for him. So this light green, the sap green with cadmium red, and then <clears throat> the dark green, the sap green with cadmium red and cobalt blue. And that's how he gets this, this dark green. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, have you ever tried something like that? Mm -hmm. Huh. To me, that's just a whole new set of thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, down below here, um, this this um, vibrant green is sap green and yellow ochre mixed together. And then the gray that he put on top of the roof is back to sap green. It's the same color used in the sky, but he's done a different mix of it. Sap green, Windsor violet, and white gouache. Isn't that fascinating, eh? And so many of these colors have more of an opaque uh, tendency, like the yellow ochre, the, the cadmium red, of course, the white gouache. And uh, so, so when I saw that, I thought, okay, I guess this is his color scheme. I guess this is what he does. But with each one of the paintings, he changes it. And again, he's using unpredictable uh, um, um, mixes. But, but what you'll see in these three examples is he has a consistency. In this case, Sap green is the is the core color, and then he's added these others to, to create all the variations of what he's got. So in this one, he starts the sky with a very light mix of cerulean blue. Then he, for his uh, light green color in these trees, cadmium yellow and cobalt blue and yellow ochre, that's how he gets this color in here. And then <clears throat> for the darker green, he goes a different mix where he goes cobalt blue, Cadmium red and cadmium yellow. Again, I would never dream of throwing these two cadmiums in to create a green. I just new to me. Ultramarine. Very opaque. Very opaque. Very, very opaque. Yeah. yeah. Down in here, the darker green again, ultramarine with cadmium yellow and cadmium red. And then <clears throat> for the color on the cow, he uses burnt sienna, cobalt blue, and alizarin crimson. 
But again, to see the consistent color that he's used through there is his cobalt blue. Mm -hmm. And everything, everything is a variation of a mix of cobalt blue. Have you, have you ever tried something like this? Is this is this a new set of thoughts to you or is it, is it just me? I love because these. they're they're opaque. I don't have them on my palette as much. I I have them, yeah. but they aren't go tos. Yeah, interesting. Eh? Mm -hmm. I like mixing opaques with yeah. transparents. I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And look at this. Um, the color in the background there is uh, cadmium red, cerulean blue, and white gouache. Wow. Pretty color. Pretty pretty beautiful. Color. But then um, <clears throat> in in here. You know, I would look at that. That was just throwing some blue in there. But no, it's a it's a cerulean blue with cadmium red mixed into it. You know, very slight, obviously, but it's so it's still very blue. But and then down into this dark area, he's using a Windsor orange. I didn't have an actual Windsor orange. I put something symbolic of it, and uh, cerulean blue in these dark areas. And then on the, the little bridge, he's using cobalt blue, cer burnt sienna, and cadmium red. I find it interesting. He goes with the cad red instead of the alizarin crimson. Yeah, yeah, and the cad red is, is much more opaque than than yeah. the alizarin. Yeah. It is fascinating. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think you know multiple lessons out of that. I'm I'm going to actually write these down, these mixes because it'll come and go out of my brain. You know, and I'll just default back to what I've always done. So I'm going to kind of keep a list of these on the side just to play around with them. We all need a bulletin board right in front of us so we can look up. Yeah. Our heads be yeah. constantly going up and down looking. Oh, yeah, right. I'm supposed to do that. Yeah. yeah. It would be good to have. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I thought that I, for me, this has been fascinating. It's just, and I found that the first one I painted, because I, I uh, have been focused on transparent pieces, I had an awful time with this. <laughs> it, it just wasn't used to the opacity of the paint and just, it took me, I did, I think I did three passes on the painting, did it three times over, just to try to figure out how to make that opaque paint work. Just, it was different for me. Anyway, any, any thoughts? <clears throat> Opaques versus transparency, any thoughts on, on those? I like the idea of adding the gouache. It, uh, gouache is really so cool. It gives you such a different vibe. Yeah, it is, but you know it? what? I guess it's all what how your your content dictates. If it needs opacity, you know whatever opacity it requires. Sometimes yeah. you just need to have that lovely transparent glow, mm -hmm. and other times, no, you really want to chunk it, you know, plaster it on and let it pop. Like the one I, I think those are your examples more or less about how something you, transparent won't pop quite the same in some, uh, a scene like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I should, I didn't, I didn't show you the, <clears throat> the fourth example that he gave us, but um, he painted, he, 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 it was a, it was a um, kind of a street scene and he painted this, the, the sky in the beginning with a, a cobalt blue. By the time he got the painting done, he went back and finished it with an, with um, cobalt blue mixed with some white gouache and, and made it more of this kind of a, of a look. It was really interesting. Just different. Who, who was it that did that painting? Because I saw the demo for that. This was on the watercolor line. It was uh, Ogali. Right. Was... Yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah, because he 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 laid the entire thing out with transparent paint, and then he came back in with all these uh, opaque uh, gouache. Yep. Colors. Yeah. Yeah, and everything popped. What a mind to to actually <laughs> be able to organize <clears throat> that scene. <laughs> it's yeah. like that was bog and boggled my mind to see that. He's yeah, quite interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Any comments? Any thoughts? You know, somebody, one of you said that you, you do use a lot of opaques. Mm -hmm. Is that you, Karen? I do, yeah. Tell us about that. Why, why they, do you just, that? they just add a, another dimension. So, I mean, wow. watercolor is absolutely the best, of course, and the translucency you can't get with any other medium. But if you use it with opaques, there are just places where an opaque um, can be effective. And uh, so I, I know a lot of people don't want to use opaques, but I have a, a no rules sort of policy. Anything that works. Anything that's that works. right. You know I like you. Yeah. That's the way to go through life. What rule? No rules. Yeah. No rules. 
I put that on the bulletin board. <laughs> yeah, no rules. No, no rules. rules. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, oh, I love that. That's isn't that awesome. pretty. Mm. So, <clears throat> washes. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts or questions or insights about how to do a great wash? I don't know how to do them. <laughs> I um I do like wetting the paper on both sides and letting it sit for a bit. I find that the wash that you put on top of that afterwards really has a nice way to sort of spread across the paper. Um, I know again this is a Michael Solovia technique, but it's not strictly his because the people who actually posted that online was actually Chief Joe's. There was a video on there that I seen about five years ago and he was doing that also showing people how to use that method so it's it's an acceptable method i guess you know in terms of starting to paint and i, I like that one frank webb also painted like that and uh if you i mean frank is one of the pillars of watercolor you know uh, so was one of the pillars of watercolor extremely well known that's how he painted as well yeah yeah so, so th th excellent. That's that's one way. How else do you tackle washes? If if you're not going to get fully wet, how, what do you do? If it's an atmospheric wash like that one, then I would do the same thing as Pauline: wet the paper on both sides, uh -huh. and then play with it, and have your spray bottle ready so that you can move the paint and be prepared to pick up your board and roll it, move it around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah excellent. <clears throat> excellent. Brian, what's that little white thing in the sky? I can't tell. A UFO, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> it's just a little lost seagull. <laughs> you got too far north. Um, um, yeah, excellent. So yeah, rolling rolling your paint around is an excellent way to do it. Um, Another thought is I'll often take my spray bottle and shoot it down before I start putting paint on so that it's not going to get some drying lines happening and I can move the paint along. Mm -hmm. um, somebody commented, I don't know if it was this class or the last class or the other class last week, but uh, the bead of water from the top. Do you guys, you're familiar with that idea? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Do I need to, do I need to demo that or do you guys, all, you're all good at that? Okay, that's an excellent little way. When Bex, Rex Beanland came out and did his uh, workshop for the Canada Group, uh, he had us paint an entire painting that way. And we would start with the bead, make our way down, not just do a wash, but we would start painting in the buildings as we moved our way down, dry it, and then we started up at the top and came down again. It was really interesting. Mm. It's really interesting. So your basic wash, you got to have the skill, right? <laughs> your watercolors are in big trouble if you don't know how to produce a nice wash. Um, <clears throat> the other thought is uh, washes can be multiple layers. Catherine O'Neill's obviously there's uh, more than one layer going on here. And uh, beautiful, beautiful washes, right? Mm -hmm. and especially if you're trying to get those darks in there. I find that it does take a few layers sometimes to get the, the dark that you want. So nothing wrong with drying it and putting in a second or a third or a fourth wash over top. So I'm almost embarrassed to show my picture here. This is, this is, I didn't even like this, but um, there, uh, uh, this was a, a textured wash <clears throat> where I put about three layers of color on going from the light up to the dark and then started splattering all through this area quite heavily with my toothbrush. So I ended up with a, with a splattered uh, textured look to it. Um, washes after the fact. <clears throat> Uh, any of you ever do that? Throw a wash on after your painting's more or less done? Yeah. 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 Any any comments, any suggestions or insights about that? You, you do you say a little prayer before you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and hope the hell you haven't like totally ruined 20 hours worth of working on something. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah. I always take a picture and try it out on my iPad first. Oh, there you yeah. go. Right, with a pencil, you just do like, you decide if you want it to be 20 or 40 or 80% and the color you want, and you just do a couple of swoops with your pencil, just to be sure, because you're right, you can ruin you know, 10 hours of work, so. 
Yeah. I even feel like that when I do a splatter, I go, should I do this or not? It's so perfect right now as if, but yeah, I know the splatter usually ends up making it, but yeah. it's that, that uh, belief you have to jump, the jump to light. Oh yeah. Okay. This is a good idea, but it's yeah. hard to do. It is scary sometimes, huh? Yeah. yeah. But you know, those watches can throw, like push something into the background that you, that's slowly moved its way up when you've been painting. Like it's a good way to keep the distance. Mm -hmm. yeah, on this particular piece, uh, I this was my little experimental piece uh, leading up to this, and um, it was just getting too busy. So I wanted to put the, the early early sun shadows on mm -hmm. there, and it pushed everything back, and it took out some of the detail I didn't want to emphasize. But yeah, yeah, that's a scary thing to do. Scary thing to do, but sometimes extremely effective. And we all have a pile of rejects where it didn't work very well. <laughs> yeah. I remember I was one, one of the first courses I one of the first classes I took I, I can't remember what, even what it was that, that uh, I had painted and the instructor said well you know you might want to just do just do a blue wash for all you know right over it and I kind of looked at him and I'm like what, <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> yeah, you're <fine>. crazy <laughs> but it actually worked it worked fine it worked out much <laughs> you're ready to ask for your money back huh yeah <laughs> Um, <laughs> so backgrounds, uh, do you paint them first or do you paint them last? What's your experience? Yes. You're painting on the piece. Hey. Right? You, yeah, you <laughs> Anyone else? How do you, anybody have kind of a system that you do? No rules. No rules. <laughs> What do you do, I like that one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if the colors of your background are in the subject, then you're doing a pale background. That's fine if there's no whites to preserve or whatever. And this is in my mind um, mm. because I don't like to uh, mask out the areas. So I really think it all depends on the content. Mm -hmm. yeah. I find that I often work them both at the same time. And then I can gauge how dark or light I want to stay with one or the other. I mean, I usually have an idea whether I'm going to have a dark background and a lighter shape, perhaps. But but in terms of getting that that balance, I'll test it as I'm painting. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, yeah. Um, uh, I asked the question because obviously we all have to deal with it. But boy, I sure not like to see painting everything nicely done and then where the painters tried to go a little bit at a time and it's starting to dry over here and it's wet over here and the color isn't quite the same here as it was over there. And ugh, that drives me nuts. <laughs> so I, I don't like that kind of thing. So I, I like to do the backgrounds first. That's just my preference because I like the harmony across the background. You know, I want it to tie together. So um, uh, um, in this case, I didn't. I didn't mask and I did do, uh, I did the background kind of concurrent with everything else, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> first layer, uh, Michael Holter is a good example of, of uh, the, the power of a first layer where you can tie your whole painting together beautifully by that first layer, but it's, it's a scary thing to do because it's a let go, let it happen all by itself experience, right? where you start put color in and color starts to go here or there and everywhere and you don't know where it's going to end up but it will tie your painting together powerfully so here's just an example i'm sure most of you've seen this before but there's my first layer on this rock and i just it was wet i just kept dropping color in and let it flow around let it go here there wherever um i didn't get it really intense like you can see obviously michael holter had some beautiful intense colors on his, his underneath part, and so did Rod, Roseanne here, but um, I kept it fairly light because there were lots of light spots in the rock. And then from there, I started to build up the rock on top of that. But uh, even there, when it's all said and done, you can see these colors that were in the initial um, wash are, are, are holding the whole thing together. Any thoughts? You guys do that sort of thing? <clears throat> I try to, yeah, we try to. <laughs> 
Karen, I'll show you shaking your head. You got any thoughts there? I love just throwing color down and see what happens, but uh, because you know, and, and the most important part of your painting, just get the color in and cross your fingers and hope it goes where you want it to go. And then uh, if it doesn't, get another piece of paper and start again. That's, that's my trick. <laughs> but all that, you've done so much drawing there. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Michael Solovyev, uh, Pauline and I were talking yesterday, we saw each other yesterday, and we were talking about something that Michael Solovyev constantly repeats. And it's a tough thing to wrap your head around, but he does, it, and he's painting wet on wet, but he applies really dark color when he starts, regardless of where he starts. And then he always says right after, remember, it's going to dry significantly lighter. So, <laughs> so Pauline and I were having a chuckle about that because um, I think Pauline might be a little bit ahead of me, but I'm certainly trying to do uh, that as well because it can be incredibly effective. And yeah. I have to say it's a little bit, I have started, I picked up this from you, Brian, and that was throwing down the color so the only difference between what you are doing and what Michael uh, Solovyev is doing is that he starts off much darker than you do. He might have, pro he probably would have accomplished this in two washes rather than in three. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you're right. And he lifts a lot. Yes. So, no, he, he uh, yeah, he does that frequently. And he's an excellent, excellent paint lifter. So <clears throat> wet on wet. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> there's a lot of, there's a wide variety of what that means. And, and I think uh, when we hear the term, this is more of the look we assume, you know, obviously wet on both sides, lots of juiciness, lots of, you know, wonderful soft edges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's kind of, that's one way to do it. And uh, it, like I say, the definition is pretty wide, pretty broad. It, it covers a lot of different things. It's a different way to paint. Um, uh, those of you who, who've done it a lot, you know, are comfortable with it. Those who venture into it for the first few times, it's frustrating because the paint's just coming here and going there and you, you never know quite where you're at. And uh, you have to just kind of let go, right? Um, <clears throat> these are some examples where it, it was less wet, but it was still more or less a wet on wet approach. And constant lifting. I found it was constantly lifting uh, paint to try to keep it from from going where I didn't want it to go. And similar sort of thing here. So any any thoughts about wet on wet? I'd like to say that it, it also corresponds a bit with a person's style. And I think we all have, I don't know, an inner vision where we're, we're trying to do something and, and there are different techniques that will serve each one, um, I guess, differently. And I think they're all beautiful. <laughs> the techniques you're showing are all, they all end up very beautiful, but uh, just different, different artists' uh, ideas of what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. You, you can get some real magical effects with wet on wet. And watercolor is the only medium that lets you do that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's the uniqueness of our watercolor. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's, mm -hmm. there's transparency. You know, little little opaque doesn't give you quite the same experience with wet on wet as transparent paint. Yeah. But and also, there's you know, go back to the discussion about paper. There's always also a difference, particularly I think, in terms of cold press and hot press if, if you're doing washes, right? Oh yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I've never thought to do a lot of wet on wet on the hot press. Have you done that, Dave? Just sort of little little sort of uh, you know. Uh, doodlings, you know, scribbles and stuff, little, you know, sort of experiments. But I find that it gives it, um, uh, like obviously, it doesn't soak up the, the um, uh, you know, the, uh, the moisture as much. But I, I find you get a really dreamy kind of, you know, milky uh, um, effect, you know, oh. which, I, which, I, which I quite like. Yeah, cool. Cool. Thanks. Anyone else any comments on wet on wet? I know, uh, Kai, you've had a lot of experience with this. Do you want to make any comments or? Well, uh, the only, I, I don't, Brian, other than to say I really like it and I really like the effects and yeah. I've been happy with it. Yeah. 
And I, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I, sometimes I like it, and sometimes I find it's it's uh, challenging. But you know, but it's there. It's it's a wonderful technique. The other course is wet on dry, and uh, there's so many things you can do with this. <clears throat> uh, this is not one of mine, but again, obviously on the tilt. They let the water run and just let us do its thing, right? And uh, you get some fun things. In this case, it was a matter of using the squirt bottle. And uh, you've got some wet paint in there. You squirt the bottle, and hold it up on its end, and let it go. And and you can get some beautiful feathery effects with, with the squirt bottle. If, you, if you're shooting just some dots rather than a spray, and uh, it'll make a nice, beautiful feathery thing as it, as it makes its way down. Uh, this On this, again, it's, it's wet on dry. But uh, tilted and spray bottle and letting the water run, 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 run. And you can see the paint is just uh, gishing its way around there, doing its own thing. But personally, that's, that's to me, that's one of my favorite approaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, technically speaking, that's wet on a dry, you know, hasn't got a lot of juiciness in it, but none, nonetheless, it's still technically the, it's wet on dry paper, right? Any comments? Any thoughts? Nothing? I got a lot to learn. Don't That's know. how I feel too. I'm trying to take <laughs> it all in, Bren. <laughs> I got to try all these things. And I, yeah, and you know, my taking things. this class help uh, encourages doing stuff that you don't just like you with uh um, talbot greaves i mean you're look you're discovering things you go wow i could do it like that um and it's true you, you just start getting into just not a rut but you do your what you're so safe on doing that's right uh, lovely that's to right. break out and just just yeah. do it yeah play play more that's yeah. right mm -hmm. safe is a good word you know we like to get into that safe zone yeah <laughs> I, I know how to do this. I'll just keep doing this. And then it gets like, you know, then you're not as inspired to, to keep, to continue. I like the idea of learning for sure. One of the biggest enemies I find is the thought, this is a $10 piece of paper. <laughs> you know, I don't want to mess this up. Yeah. Right? Well, <laughs> I want us all to think or realize that we're worth it because it's more than just paper. What we're working with. It's, it's right. ourselves that yeah. we're working with. Right. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Looking at these paintings, it'll be a long time before I get out of uh, watercolor kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in it for years. <laughs> you know, you just keep learning. <laughs> hey, Menju, you're coming from the, the oil and, uh, you know, acrylic world. And back to what Karen said about, you know, there's magical things that watercolor can do that the others can. That's the bridge to cross for you. Where, where you can get it wet and put the color in and let it, let go. That's the hardest part about, about watercolor, yeah. let go. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to control it, right? <laughs> I have to ask another question, though. It's just a rhetorical question, but I mean it quite sincerely. Why would you want to get out of kindergarten? I mean, yeah. <laughs> think back. <laughs> What, wasn't it one of the best times of your life when you were in kindergarten? So <laughs> true. <laughs> Guaranteed naps and, and, and treats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, Menju, that's, that's the real challenge is putting that water down on the paper and letting the color, you know, do its thing and to let go. And Karen said earlier, you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. You know, that's scary. It's very scary. Yeah. yeah, but the cool thing is, I don't know, I think all of us have had the experience probably as many times where you start a painting and you get a quarter of the way and you're going, oh, this thing's a mess, right? Oh, and in, true. Reality, in reality, it's not. It's just that it's doing a bunch of this kind of thing. And then, then you start building into it, the, you know, your objects or whatever, wherever you're going with it. And all of a sudden, wow, there it is. I, with, with, um, um, let me flip you back here for a second to, to uh, uh, these, this guy. Um, <laughs> as, as I did, <clears throat> as I was taking these classes with him, uh, okay. let me you know, he, he is so 
loose in his, his application of paint. It's just kind of smooshed here, smooshed there, scrubbed in a little bit over there, you know, ground in over here. And, um, you know, and then then just these these uh, uh, dry brush things happening here, there, and everywhere. And as I was doing it, I was thinking, oh, these things look like a mess. <laughs> what a piece of junk. And then all of a sudden, there's that point where now you put in the, the branches of the tree. Then all of a sudden, my goodness, this is a great little looking little painting. And, and it was just the addition of those few branches that took it from a bunch of meaningless shapes to suddenly, wow, that's kind of cool. So, you know, um, yeah, too many times, I, as I look back to my early beginning of watercolor, I see some pieces that I got partway into and I, I, I threw them away. And it was because I had reached that point and I thought I had a disaster on my hands, when in truth, probably had something that was going to be really good if I'd kept at it. Brian, I've done the same, same, same thing. And I walk out of the room and I think, okay, I'm never painting again because that was <laughs> another piece of crap. And it's because you got to this midsection yeah. and it's nothing like mud is mud, but you, you think this is all mud and it's yeah. not. It's just a mess that you've got to create from. And yeah, I know. I think that in every painting has to, has to have that stage that disaster stage where you yeah. could easily walk away and yeah. you should at that point you should walk away but then come back to yeah. it and if you have to keep fixing it that's where the problem is for me if if i've if i continue working it and working it and i'm still not happy okay then i know i've gone i've gone too far and now i am wasting my time but that <laughs> first thing you gotta you gotta pass that you gotta climb that wall there. You have you have to know when to walk away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's too often mm -hmm. we leave too soon. There yeah. are also two painters that everyone should take a look at at some point in time. And Brian, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them. I think their names are Blockley, both of them, and as they yeah, Blockley, yeah, Blockley, John, John Blockley, yeah, yeah, Blanc and his daughter Anne, um, and the, the, they're absolutely inspirational. Uh, because of the approach that they take to painting. So I have I have been, when I remember about them, I, I there's one painting I did. This would be a typical Blockley technique. I painted it and I thought it was god awful. So I just got a credit card and scraped all the paint off in most, you know, in four areas out of the five on the painting. And then I started again. And of course it left me with absolute wonderful textures. And I was just able to build on some new colors. And it's one of my favorite paintings, one where I actually scraped most of it away and kept right on going. Uh, you know, I just kept 20% of the painting, it turned out beautifully. But they often did that. They often scraped off all of the paint and just kept right on going and they produce beautiful pieces of work, especially their their flowers were a popular theme for them and their flowers are spectacular. So if you haven't seen them, you should look at them. They're great. What's his name? John Blockley. John? Because I have Anne on my screen here, but I- That's, that's his daughter. His daughter, I think he's passed now. That's his daughter. Look at her equally. It doesn't matter which one you look at. They're both the same. All right, thank you. So now we were talking about brushes and tools earlier. So Kai, is that American Express or MasterCard? <laughs> 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 which which tool worked better for you? <laughs> no, no. Tell me something simple here. How do you scrape off a watercolor? It has to be wet, but okay. if, it, if it's wet and you've just made a big mess, you can just okay. get it. Get a credit card and you can scrape it off if you okay. if particularly if you put on, you know, a fair bit of pigment. Ron Hazel, who is uh, CSPSW, whatever the acronym is, member and who teaches a lot, um, does that all the time. That's how he creates the effect on rocks. He yeah. puts on thick pigments on the rocks and then uses a credit card to scrape it off. Well, um, isn't that interesting? Yeah. If you haven't seen it, it lead leaves a really interesting effect it is it's very very effective to create the te texture in rocks uh, another thank thing you kai do, yeah another thing you can do is if you, you feel like oh this isn't working it's real mess stand it up get out your skirt bottle and squirt 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 let it run and you can sweep a bunch of it away and 
come back and keep going. You know, or put it in your tub and turn on the shower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of things you can do to to rescue it. <laughs> Especially when you get mud, you know, you want to get rid of the mud. Those are nice ways to do that, you know, and then suddenly the color starts coming back from underneath. Anyway, um, good. So this isn't this a beautiful little piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really dropping in color so so my question is looking at this what what do you see layer wise how did the painter do this huh. where well, do you think it started um, lots of masking i think i think he he laid down a lot of color and then um let it dry and then did some negative painting to get the leaf shapes yeah and the trees and yeah to bring out the uh the details yeah it looks like pouring it kind of does look like pouring because of some of the what's going on up in here and mm -hmm. some of these areas too yeah and and even the the shape of those trees looks like it might have been poured but it looks as though it started with the this yellow layer and probably morphed into a green up here and then these these succeeding layers that followed. Not a gorgeous piece, though, eh? Mm -hmm. Just the very little masking, but those three white branches. Mm -hmm. Just these, yeah, yeah, just yeah, gorgeous. So again, the idea of dropping in color, <clears throat> um, where you let it, uh, it's wet. You drop it in, and you, you know this was pretty unplanned. Mm -hmm. Except that the artists knew they were dropping the red in. <laughs> <laughs> where it was going to go, you know, it just, it did its own thing. Um, look at this for dropping in color. Isn't that pretty? And what an effective composition to take this pretty, you know, ordinary looking stormy sky, but, but dropping these lines into it, turn it into something quite fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Huh. And again, dropping in color, you know, like here, there was, there would have been some lifting in some places. Drop it while it's wet, drop it in some darks, drop in some of these uh, warm colors. Gorgeous. And again, you're just out of control, right? You know mm -hmm. where you want some darks, you know where you want some lights, and you work with that. Here's another one. How do you keep something like this from going muddy when you're dropping color in? Drop the color in and don't don't mix it around too much. Just yeah. Let yeah, it walk it's away. Keep the, just don't keep the blues to the blues and the purples yeah. to the purples. <laughs> then keep your color mixes pure. Like don't add any opaques to that, or you'll get mud. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Don't mix on the palette. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see here, if this artist had dropped the blue into there, it would have gone. You know, the blue and the purple, or the blue and the orange would have gone mud. Yeah. Mud. So they dropped orange here, dropped blue up here, and let it. Do it so in the mixing. Drop these beautiful, I think that's almost a pyrene violet in there. But, yeah. And boy, isn't that tempting to just get your brush and oh, I just want to drop something <laughs> back in there. And then after the fact, oh, you dummy, <laughs> you knew better. <laughs> but you get gorgeous things by dropping in color. This is kind of an interesting thought. Um, backgrounds or blooms, using them to your advantage which is kind of a fun idea, eh? And in this case, obviously there's a whole lot of salt going on, but there's also these, these blooms that the artist has carefully laid into place to, to work for them. Another, another effective mm -hmm. use of a bloom. Any of you ever do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Karen, what, tell us. I love, I love blooms and you can pretend that they were deliberate even when they weren't. <laughs> yeah, I love blooms too and, and some, watercolor purists or whatever everybody has their opinions go oh my god that's the mark of an artist who doesn't know how to control their watercolor <laughs> i think it's no, i think any marks it's about marks on paper regardless yeah. any mark yeah. yeah beautiful yeah i think there's a guy brian that paints mainly with blooms like mm. most of his work is based on blooms like he just puts the paint down lets the sheen go and then just works with a dropper and mm. water and does his painting, composes his painting that way. I can't remember his name, but uh, his work is gorgeous. How fun, eh? Mm -hmm. So, hey, how do you get rid of a bloom you don't want there? 
Well, you can let it dry and then take it at the hard edge, but I think mm -hmm. it's beautiful bloom. <laughs> no such thing as, as uh, a bloom that's not beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but I think all of us have had blooms that we didn't want there. And uh, um, one of the things I've found is my little spray bottle is great. Yeah. Just spray it and so let that, let that edge disseminate out. Mm -hmm. I, do, I use two spray bottles. I've got the big one that gives big drops, and I've got the little tiny one that gives little tiny drops. And each one has its own magic. Texture. <clears throat> Ray Hendershot. He's a great texture painter. Isn't that a beautiful piece? Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Uh, I think his, his comment, he's done a number of these wintry scenes like this, and in his comment, he was, you know, it was, it was a little scary to get out the white paint and start throwing that snow on top of that. But uh, very successful, very beautiful. So I'll show you a couple of things. One, <clears throat> if you look on this piece here, you can see that's a highly textured um, grass and a highly textured set of trees in the back. And even up in here, he's got lots of texture happening. One of his tools that he uses is, um, and, and I, since I've done this, I never, ever, ever use a fan brush. I find it's just way too uniform for me. Mm -hmm. But what he did is he took an old brush and he, he twisted and bent those, the, the hairs out and he stuffed glue and paint and everything else down into the bottom here and did everything <laughs> good to mash the thing out. And the more mashed and more yucky and awful it became, the more useful the brush became for him. And uh, then he would let, you know, that glue it all dry and he's got this, this, um, very uneven thing and he'll do all kinds of texturing with this you know he'll mash it down in, in some places he'll use it you know gently like a brush in other places but but he finds it's very effective so let me here's out of his book this is how he would do like a forest scene in the back where he would paint the initial wash and um, he calls it his scary brush this is what he calls his scary <laughs> brush <laughs> so he said he'd use a modified bristle fan brush to lay in the initial wash for the trees. He pull the brush down from the top so the bristles form fine branches at the top of the trees, right? So he's got, you know, that edge becomes very, it's not just a soft edge, but it's got some, a little bit of feel to it. Intensify the value and varied direction of your brush strokes as you work down. Don't be too careful. You don't want an even wash. Inconsistency adds to the effectiveness as the paper dries continue to work in darker areas further defining the tree forms. Leave a ragged edge at the bottom. Use bitter water to soften the transition between the woods and the ground and allow it to dry. So there would be his first uh, wash. Wow. And it's, it's a mottled thing, you know, he's just trying to get lots of var variety in it. Then he uh, starts splattering and uh, he splatters um, uh, large regular patterns, uh, it's a messy process. He says, you know, whatever, but he's, he splatters like crazy. He's a real heavy splatterer. And then he uh, used his splatter with less fluid mixture in the deeper value, produces the additional smaller, more distinctive not dots, add some darker values to create shadow at the base of the trees, pick up the very dark, thick mixture with the fan brush and using the flat of the brush in a padding motion, apply regular shapes. Now that's where he would take that scary brush and he's just kind of like staccato on the audio, you know, doink, 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 and he's making these, these little uh, marks in there. He does a lot of that. And, uh, and then <clears throat> he paints in the, some tree trunks and uh, has a very effective in behind uh, looking forest. He's really good. If you like this, his kind of work, you'd find it fascinating to study his books. But then again, he's, he's the texture man. His son, He's, he has passed away, and his son, Brad Hendershot, currently teaches classes. Uh, Danielle has taken a few of his classes. Yeah. And uh, she said he was really, she was really surprised at how, how um, much texturing he does. And uh, almost, it's almost no standard paintbrush experience. It's almost all texturing, texturing, texturing. Anyway, any thoughts on texturing? Any, got any insights? Some of you use sponges. Uh, anything else to use? I agree with him about the fan brush. That yeah. gives you texture, but it's terrible. Yes, 
some people cut them up with their scissors, you know, to try to get some variety in them, but uh, yeah. I like to use a sponge sometimes, mm -hmm. a, a natural um, sea sponge. Yeah. Yeah, you can get some nice effects with a sponge, yeah. The trick, the trick I've found with a, with a sponge is, let's say you're trying to do uh, oh, some foliage. <clears throat> and I find that um, in, invariably, I end up thinking I've got the right value and I put it on and it dries too light. And then with that irregular shape, there's no way I can go back in and drop deeper color into it. Mm -hmm. And that often becomes my challenge when I try to sponge. <laughs> so I have to think dark and, and deep if that's what I'm actually aiming for. Any other texture thoughts? Okay. Bev, you said earlier, there's a lot to take in. I'm, so I'm kind of shotgunning everybody today. <laughs> so this is, is a fire hose moment, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but you'll have the PowerPoint, so I hope you can go back and have a look at that. Okay. This one's interesting because he paints a lot of the stones, and then he's got this white uh, sunspot in the middle of it. It's just uh... I think that's cement or something. It's not a sunspot. He, he'll it's often do that with these stone yeah. walls. Yeah, to keep it's those so stones from crumbling further, right? To oh, and it's, to, it's so that it's not too repetitive all the way through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. if it was all very detailed stones, it would you, you wouldn't look at it. But that mm -hmm. white splash through the middle, yeah, just emphasizes it. He's got it's it at the bottom of the stairs too. That I think it's like a mortar or something that keeps the stones yeah. from further deterioration or whatever. Yeah. I've seen that before too. And he purposely does that as a compositional item. Yeah. It, you know, just repetitive, it would just be boring. Yeah, you wouldn't notice it, but because of that white spot, you notice all the stones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very effective, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So here, here was a, um, a textured wall that I did that I, it was so fun to do. I, again, it just, it's a let go experience, right? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, you know, I'm splattering, I'm dripping, I'm, you know, tossing paint and color here, there, everywhere. It was just fun to do. And the, the interesting thing is, I didn't, you know, there's there's unfinished portions of it that you don't even see because there's so many other things happening. And that was just a fun little wall to do. It's one of those rock walls you see when you're driving along the highway and you get out and you take a picture and think, I got to do something with that someday. And that's kind of where that came from. <clears throat> Layering, I think everybody... Very familiar with the idea of layering. Isn't this a beautiful example? Mm -hmm. You see these gorgeous light tones and then he's come in with, he or she's come in with these darker layers over top. Beautiful. Any comments on layering? Anybody have any tricks or tips? You have to know when to stop, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good It's comment. hard because some of the trick I mean, your dark colors, you have to be brave and go in with them dark enough right from the get go, because if you try to go in and deepen them later, they go flat. So to get your rich darks, you've got to just be brave and charge in there with your paint. Mm -hmm. So to go in and layer on top of that afterwards, uh, you can just, it just flattens it. It just takes that luminosity off your dark and flattens it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good comment. Yeah. And the scary thing is when you've still got a lot of white paper, that dark always looks like it's going to be too dark. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's a tough one to, to get to overcome. Isn't that pretty? I, I watched somebody do a painting once uh, online. It was, it, it was a painting of, a, of a, it was a night scene, uh, sort of a street kind of night sort of night street scene and there was a lot of black in in the uh, uh image and i was just, i was amazed at how many layers of different colors went underneath the darkest the, the final darkest layer wow. and uh i asked somebody you know like why bother if you're just going to paint black over it and they and, they, and, they, and the answer was of course well it gives it depth right it gives it you know, uh, even though you sort of can't, you can sort of consciously see it, it does add depth to it. And, you know, a painting crows, 
and <clears throat> I went, I, I tried a crow with one color and it was flat like a pancake. And, uh, you know, I tried it with, with uh, a mixture of colors and it was amazing how much of a difference there is, so. Yeah, yeah, good comment, good comment, dude. Yeah, such a, so true. <laughs> it's easy to get flat colors with watercolor too, isn't it? <laughs> So, um, Pauline, can you comment? You, I, I commented last week you got these beautiful soft edges, but I think you, you kind of commented about your brush. Is there anything else, tricks you can tell us about how you get those soft edges? Yeah, well, um, basically the background, I think I, I mentioned last week, the, uh, first of all, it's 300 pound paper, so it takes more abuse than, you know, something that's lighter. Um, so, when I painted this, the and, and I actually often do the same painting a couple of times, and I learned from the first one. But the bottom line is that I, in some other uh, tests that I was doing to paint this, I was finding that it was sticking out too much and not really looking like it was in the water. And at the very end, <clears throat> after having done the background, after having completed the fish, completed everything, it's where I thought it needed something to, to look like it blended more with the background. And at that point, I just basically add a little bit of paint on my brush, use, um, and then again, I, I come back to the brushes that you talked about earlier. So either the, uh, the three, um, <clears throat> like this one here, the Solovia one, or the other one I showed you, and, and just put some color into the brush, uh, pick up some of the same color of the background, like a blue, in this case, blue green, and just brush it into the edges. So I did that along the right side. And you see that mostly where it blends in. So that fin at the back and in the, yeah, like basically that whole right side ended up getting some of the color from the background into the, uh, the shapes. And then at the top where his little nose is I kept that crisp and how wet was your brush when you're doing that how wet was it it had so it can't be too wet <laughs> it's almost got to be closer to dry but wet enough that it doesn't make lines so you always have to test it I, what I do is I'll, I'll put some water on it put some paint on it and then use my fingers and just squeeze water out of it try it on a piece of paper on the side see how much water is still left in there and so it's like closer to the dry stage than it is to the super wet stage okay perfect thanks thanks hey i'm going to take you off share for a second i want to show you something um can you see my uh, uh little picture of a duck there mm -hmm. is that is that come up for everybody yes. nope Right. Oh, yes. Okay. Got it. Yep. Okay. Let me show you real quick. This was a trick that, um, this was a comment that uh, Ian Stewart made in a in workshop I was in where he said, <clears throat> you've got, uh, he's got, um, you know, a lighter color that's going to go down and then you get the darker color uh, atop beside it. He said, you don't want to end up with a, an edge like that where you're trying to match an edge like this because inevitably you end up with that double line. And mm -hmm. you have, I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but you can see it, it gets uh, super dark right in there. So he said, he said, and he, it was one of the he, very subtle comment. He said, he said, this is actually one of my tricks. He said, when, when he'll lay a, a lighter wash down, um, he will let it run all the way into, um, like let's say, let's say, uh, this were going to be a lighter wash in behind here. He would run it past that line. He would run it right in into the object itself. And then when he when that's all dry and he comes back in with a darker color, now as he paints that edge, now he gets the edge that he wants, right? And he's not getting that that double line in there. See what mm. I'm saying? So he said, uh, you know, don't don't paint to the line, paint past the line so that uh, you can end up with a nice sharp line after the fact. Hmm. Okay. Did that, did that make sense? But I was... Yep. Okay. Maybe that it was just, it was a subtle thing. He said, uh, it's one of my tricks. <laughs> no, he said, it's one of my secrets. He said, 
It's one of my secrets to my paintings. So I, that's that's uh, passed that along as a freebie. Um, lifting. Um, I'm assuming some of these sunlight marks in here have, I think some have been, been painted around, but I think there's been some lifting happening there too. Uh, Karen, you do some lifting. Does anybody else do lifting? You guys have any comments about lifting color? Karen, Karen, you there's, do. Um, yeah, there's some beautiful directional lifts there. The floor on the right hand side, they've been um, deliberate about lifting um, from an angle, like so from that window line swooping in to the right and down, like in order to get that directional light and then they've gone in it looks like with their uh, cast shadow from the stool legs and put those back in after that lifting patch dried mm -hmm. lots of lifting here it's beautiful yeah. very beautiful yeah 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 so again when when we get to that point where we're thinking oh no i've taken it too far ah um don't forget you can lift and and um don't forget your opaques sometimes you can come back in oh i wish i still had that lighter area in there, well, pull some opaques in, you can pull some of that back in, right? So there aren't that many disasters that can't uh, be dealt with somehow in watercolor. Of course, we all have a pile that, that uh, says that's not true. <laughs> the discard pile. <laughs> yeah, don't, we, don't forget the whole idea of lifting. Negative painting, of course, I think everyone's familiar with that. It's the idea that you paint behind the objects, painting behind those tree trunks putting the darks in and it pulls them forward. I guess pretty standard. Any comments about negative painting? All right. Um, <clears throat> what do you do to create your darks? Somebody asked the question earlier. What's your formula for darks? Whatever your Indigo, dark, sepia. Yeah, whatever sepia. your darkest uh, triad of colors. I use a lot of viridian, alizarin, and quin gold. Mm -hmm. Say it again, alizarin? Viridian, alizarin, and quin gold. Okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. Um, any others? I like the indigo and uh, perline violet. Mm -hmm. Oh, that'd be pretty, yeah. French ultra and brown matter are similar. It's, it's a beautiful dark. Okay. Okay. I really like uh, Quinn burnt orange and indigo mm. produces a really lovely and depends on how much of which one you put in, but it produces a lovely, very dark color that can be on the warm side or the cool side. Yeah. <clears throat> if I want a black, I use uh, Lauren McCracken's formula where he uses uh, a Prussian blue, carbazole violet, and and uh, uh, and then he starts adding warm colors, and he'll he'll uh, sepia, and uh, quin gold and a few other things like that. But he he produces a, a really rich uh, black. <clears throat> but yeah, that's uh, always a challenge in that. <laughs> sepia oh, and indigo is good too. Yeah, sepia is good for that. It's a warm one, so if you're if you're trying to get a cool color. Indigo might get you more of the cool look you're looking after. Um, back to uh, uh, Talbot Greaves. Um, as I as I work in those little demo paintings, is cadmium red is one of the key pieces he uses to get the dark darker colors. He darkens those greens by throwing in the cad red. Now, I was surprised when I when I did that how effective that was. What does he use as the green though? Like, what does he start with again? Well, back to those formulas, you know, he'll use a, a cobalt blue and a and a cadmium yellow, or you know, there's just a whole series of or yellow ochre. Okay. Yeah. Cerulean blue and yellow ochre, that kind of thing. It's not just like two. Like yeah, two no, it's, usually, it's usually three colors. But, yeah. Yeah. But he, he'll take a color that's an okay value, and he'll drop some cadmium red into it, and it darkens it up. Yeah, interesting. So here's the last thought we'll share is scrubbing. Look at how, I think this is Mark Foley. And look how he's taken his, it looks like a stiff brush and he's scrubbed and pushed and pulled and scraped and he's done all kinds of fun things in there to, 
to produce some really fun textures. Mark uses a cloth to Is pull. It? Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you taken a course from him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, was that a yes? Yes, yes. He uses soft paper and uh, he uses a cloth to pull. Any other tips from him? Uh, he has a very limited palette and uh, he goes, his darks are beautiful. Um, yeah. but he uses really just a cloth. It's just layering and then swiping fast swipes. Mm. So. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I thought you, I assumed that was a stiff brush you'd used there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other thoughts about how to put paint in? We good? Now, we've only got half an hour left, so we'll probably move past this quickly, but just I found this fellow, uh, Pasqualino uh, Fracasa. And uh, if we'd had time, I was just going to say, let's walk through and what did he do and how did he do it, you know? Because he's got some beautiful things going on here, some wet areas and, you know, other techniques he's used that are quite beautiful. And uh, anyway, we, we probably don't have time to do that. But uh, um, <clears throat> this week, topic is flight. And uh, uh, there's all kinds of fun things here, just some nice little paintings that have been done. Uh, you can find some, some very colorful birds you know, and uh, some kind of fun things that way. There's some different approaches I, I've kind of tossed out there. There's a, there's a, you know, very tight little painting, but he has some fun with some things like this too. Splash and get crazy. Again, a few more splash and crazy, some drippiness. Um, uh, it's just a couple I've done, um, which I was actually more interested in the landscape than I was in the bird. <laughs> So I just threw the bird in because it's kind of empty without the, without it. But <laughs> so the bird was after the fact. <laughs> um, these weren't flights, but I thought they were just kind of nice little paintings just to give you a feel. I love what the artist has done with, with the way the painting, the color's been dropped in. And this was actually online. And unfortunately, um, <clears throat> it was a little video that, that I pulled off. And uh, when you did the still, it, it unfortunately didn't give you a nice clear view of what's going on because there's some beautiful, beautiful opaque line work that the artist has done throughout here that's been really pretty. But anyway, and I, <laughs> I don't know if this is a painting or a photograph, but <laughs> it's so good I had to throw it in. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Looks like something from a Gru movie, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody's got a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that good? And, and I found this one, which is, oops, no, wait a minute. Where did that other one go? I had another one. Huh. I've lost it. Okay, anyway, it'll show up. So this week I had an, I had an awful time because <clears throat> I guess I just, Peking Birds and something I just was resonating with. So I, I sketched and I drew and I tried and I, and all kinds of things, and finally, I just said, Oh, what the heck? I'm just going to paint two swans. So <laughs> I did. Beautiful. Uh, I'm not even all that impressed with it myself, but You're lovely. But a couple things I did pick up uh, just tips as you go into this you, you can't fake what's going on in those wings, right? I mean, you know, you look at, you look at something like, uh, like this, you know, the artist had to spend the time to see what's happening there. So you can't you can't fake your way through that. You, you really need to to study it, look at it, determine. I didn't. It's not like I. It's not like I was painting, you know, detail for detail, but I had to study it to see what the patterns were, so that the patterns made sense, and then I, I was able to paint it from that point. But like I say, it's not detail for detail, but nonetheless, uh, there were things that had happened. The other thing I discovered was um, just there were a couple of uh, white. Like on you know on the top of the feather, white strips, and they were they were somewhat crucial. Sorry, Brian. Yes. Did you take Zadie out earlier? Uh, not yet. Not oh yet. my gosh. Honey. Yeah. Sorry. Um. So I this I just compositionally, this is actually fairly large. It's fourteen inches by thirty four inches. Wow. And um, let me show you how I went about doing this. I, I you know used my grid. I sketched up the the birds to begin with 
and then I did a little detail on top of that. I didn't like the way they were sat on the on the format. I wanted them a little bit more, and I didn't like the fact that they were touching each other quite as much. So I did a third one where I, over top I, I I pulled the board, birds apart, and then I finally got it onto the board and went from there. I just wanted to show you that the the process took a while to get it from two separate geese. They weren't they weren't from the same photograph. Two separate geese. They looked the same actually. I, I was surprised when I was finished that they did. This is not what I <laughs> what I thought I was going to get, <laughs> but they did end up looking <laughs> pretty familiar. Anyway, so this week's assignment: <clears throat> find yourself some some nice birds to paint, and you're welcome to you know do the background with them, or if you want to do like you saw some of those other ones where the background is left empty, you can you know you choose how you want to tackle it. But there are some nice nice uh, pictures on there. If you go online, you find all kinds of really nice ones. You know, there's some beautiful colors you can play with. <clears throat> that's that's got some nice drama in it. I like I like those ones. And hummingbirds, of course, are loaded with with fun things. Anyway, so there's just some suggestions, and you're welcome to tag. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. <clears throat> the thing that's doubly beautiful is is the green background uh, against the purple and the orange. And this, <clears throat> I was really intrigued with this. I'm not even sure if that's a photograph or a painting, but I'm sure intrigued with how beautiful it is. It's a painting, but somebody has captured the actual colors of the starling. That's what it is. It's a starling. And they really are those colors, but you yeah. have to have the right sort of light. But they really have done a great job. It's beautiful, isn't it? <clears throat> really beautiful. Oh, there it is there. Photography. Oh, it says photography. Mm -hmm. It's a photo that's been pulled off and put on a solid color background. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Yes, so that's how it should be painted then. That surprises me because that they've they've altered, they've somehow been used Photoshop to really emphasize the colors. And and like you say, putting it on that background, it's done it. Yeah. Yeah. Very pretty though, eh? Mm -hmm. But you know, to get into something like this, that we can see you can't just fake your way through that. You can't just whack a couple lines and hope it's gonna work. You're gonna have to do some studying. So I thought this was a cool. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I couldn't help but look at it and think it reminded me of Sam the Eagle. For <laughs> it's just such a simple thing to turn the look. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, let's go have a look at your paintings. <laughs> so, so, Annie, look at this cool thing Annie did with this water. Wow. And he's. <laughs> Is that with masking that you created that? Yeah, masking. Wow. I used the masking. And what did you do? Just dribble it on? Uh, no, I used the ruling uh, the ruling pen oh, to okay. use the masking through it. Just, yeah. Wow. Very cool. Rolling around the, 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 the ruling pen and they go everywhere. Okay. Beautiful. Make the effect. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you were coming up with this, the water design, just. From yeah. The... Yes. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I was just weighing it in. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's pretty Beautiful. interesting. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Are you guys any thoughts? Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Much, yeah. You're ready for your PhD. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. That's great, Annie. Yeah. I awesome. love the leg in the water. Just the, yes. you can see it, but you can't. That's what gorgeous. Nice. Yes. Well, what inspired you to do that? Like, did you have um some water reference, or did you do you know water that well that this is how the wolf would be running through it? Uh I saw a couple of picture, but you water is water, right? You just spread it in, and then... easy for you to say, Annie. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> no, Come you on. try it. You just <laughs> spread it, like, water in the the masking food, and, and just yeah, spread it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. 
And then I'll do that hope next for the time. best. Every time I just hope best. for the best. Yeah. If it turn out, and I put for the blue, I put the blue and green in, and use the saran wrap. Mm -hmm. oh. Ah, mm -hmm. ah, okay, yeah. Saran wrap wait for a while, and then uh, take out the saran wrap, and then soften it a little bit. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, because I found the ceram wrap, the edge is too hot everywhere. Yeah. So I kind of use it. I just wait about 10, 20 minutes and then I just soften it after. Mm. Wow, it sure worked. Worked yeah. well. That's really cool, eh? Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to show you guys next week <clears throat> if Annie's okay with this. I'm going to show both classes uh, a piece she did a couple of weeks ago. We're going to be talking about motion next week. And uh, she captured a, a group of horse racers beautifully. I mean, it's, I, I can't wait to show it to you. It's really, really awesome. It's really awesome. Oh. Are you okay with that, Annie, if I should share it? Sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> hey, beautiful piece, eh, guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Very. Uh, very fun, very fun. Uh, Bev, you didn't get a chance to send one in? No, I did not. No, I'll still work on it, though. Yep. All right, perfect. This is David's follow-up from last David. week. Mm -hmm. Are we saw it? Are we done? Mm -hmm. That's really pretty. Yeah. The gorgeous um, color. Wow. Mm -hmm. Great glow. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. What colors were you using to get that green? Yeah. <laughs> I, I used all of my greens. <laughs> <laughs> but this one is Basically. so... Uh, you know. Yeah, well, I basically started with uh, one of those... Um, granulating greens, there's a forest green, as, as uh, I did a wash all over. Yeah. And, uh, and then I just uh, uh, added consecutive darker uh, uh, hues of green. And until I got about as dark as I could get, added some, I think some uh, Prussian blue or something like that in there as well. And some tint, some neutral tint to go as dark as I could with the, with the background wash, right? Yeah. Boy, that's sure nice. Mm -hmm. And this particular green, what did you say it was? Uh, the base is a forest. It's called forest green. I think it's a. I think it's one. Of, it's one of those granulating. Uh, okay. It's so oh. neon. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. neon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Glowy. <clears throat> you can just see the sun coming through. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, very nicely done. And your drawing is. My goodness, dead on. It's awesome. And I really appreciate uh, the comment you made last week about the fins and the orange and the fins. And when you said, uh, don't be afraid to lay, you know, lay it on fairly heavy, yeah. right? So on the bottom, but that bottom right, but the two bottom fins, uh, yeah. I did that. And I really liked the effect of uh, the light shining through. Yeah, good. Good, good, yeah. What a great painting. That's awesome. Hey, how come you guys don't sign your paintings? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's your second piece for this week. And you actually pick a tough, a tough photo reference because it's so um, the values are so close. That was a toughie. So, but, so let's have a look at what you did with it. It turned out nice. Oh, it's lovely. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's a challenge. Your values are so close. That, you mm -hmm. know, so many subtleties. That's a tough. That's a tough one. The reflections are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Really nice. Yes. Yeah. Nice job, Dave. Yeah. What I like about this one is that, I, opposed to the fish, which I used, you know, I, I don't know how many different colors I used in that, but. Uh, in this one, I used like basically three or four colors and that was it. It was really, it was really a pleasure to do that, <laughs> you know? Cool. Cool, that's awesome. Nice little painting. That's really good. That's really good. Yeah, thank you. Aileen, you picked a challenge. Well, hell, <laughs> it's the only way I'm gonna learn. Don't do that again. Uh, I've loved that photo. A friend of mine took that in 2016, and uh, I thought it was just amazing. Green heron. Um, so when I sent you the 
to the, both of us, I said, here's my ambitious attempt at doing this. Yeah. It was just, it's nowhere near what the photo is, blah, blah. But I had fun doing it anyway. It was, it was really a challenge to look at it and go, is that normal? Because the photo doesn't look normal. The way yeah. how, how sharp his shadow is. Mm. You see everything so crisp and sharp. And then as soon as you're out of his shadow, it's all soft edges. So it was an exercise in patience. <clears throat> what? This, this is better than the photo. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> yeah, such a pretty bird. And it was kind of weird looking at the, the feet and the way you know how it refractions go happen when you, you see something going in water and how it bends and all that. Uh, and then I did the splatter thing after going, I think it needs splatter. So I just put a little tissue on top of the bird. I didn't do anything special. I just put tissue in and then just, that's it. It, it, it added, added nicely, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You like splatter, huh? I'm getting there, yep. <laughs> yeah, the splatter <laughs> brings it all together. Part. I'm sorry? The splatter brings it all together. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think yeah. it's, for me so far, it's the, the one thing that I'm uh, letting myself loose on because I seem to be going down a more tight route. And I don't necessarily want to go there, but I ain't complaining. Um, yeah, so that is my homage to looseness <laughs> for what that's worth. Good job. That's really Thank pretty. You. That's really pretty. So your friend took that picture. That's uh, that's a yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he I think he was out uh, fly fishing in the Gas Bay, and that's hmm. one of the birds that he shot. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh George, George uh, I, uh, was going to but he's come from Helen. <laughs> this is an wow. ambitious piece. <laughs> wow, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love, Love it. it. Yeah. Tell us tell us what you did, Helen. <laughs> well, I I drew and I really I enjoy the drawing because it it as you say, you get to study the birds and figure out where their feathers are and how they go and so on. And drawings on the left. And I had to you know, do my lights and darks, but I had to get the blue in. So I just took some uh, um, blue chalk and put it in the in the drawing so that I could, you know, understand where I needed that color. Okay. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Mm. But yeah, he's on the still, still water. Yeah. But splash it up behind. And I think the, the you could say I have to put the reflections below, but yep. just all the splatter which was just uh, frisked on a toothbrush. Yep. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I, and I um, used packing tape over the bird. Okay. Is it manganese blue? No. What is um, it? It might be. It was a blue <laughs> I don't usually use. Yeah, because it's, it's really beautiful. Just mm -hmm. watery beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That and a bit of... Um, cobalt turquoise not too much because mm -hmm. initially I thought it was all cobalt turquoise and then when I did my sketch I said oh no this is really quite blue mm -hmm. great job wow. I just love it Helen it's gorgeous oh, thank you I know I, I was uh, I was pleased with the mm -hmm. me too wonderful beautiful the um you know when you've got the packing tape over the bird you can't see how the bird's going to turn out you're trying to get this yeah. <laughs> splatter and splash and yeah. colors in in the background is kind of hard to to work to so i was very happy when i took the uh, plastic off and yeah. got to work on the feathers yeah hey helen what i really like here is um you know it's a white bird but you've done a great job of that shadow under there mm -hmm. i kept darkening that yeah yeah and right down to a, to almost a what an eight and a half black there you know yeah love it and that 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 makes that bird um real and, and round and live i like it yeah yeah the i would do it walk away and then come back so no that still needs to be darker and it still could make it darker again yeah. and it's scary isn't it to, yeah to dark on a white, <laughs> on a white swan <laughs> yeah nice nice very very nice 
Yeah, and I did lose weight, lose my track and the feathers on the on the right wing. They they uh, oh, aren't quite doing the right thing. But and they look great. Mm -hmm. But you've got totally the feel of what's happening there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice job. Yeah, I like the still water underneath. That uh, mm -hmm. that turned out okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fun, eh? Where's mm -hmm. that signature? Oh. <laughs> God. <laughs> So, okay, so Karen Tackle, <clears throat> an interesting uh, thing here. She, it's a bear in the water, right? Wow. So, wow. <clears throat> so, um, um, <laughs> so here's where she went with that. There's her little drawing, and there's the beginning of it. Karen, do you want to comment as we go through these? Well, I thought I've never painted a bear before, so I'm just going to throw in the paint and see where it lands. So I did a little masking just where I wanted to retain some of the white uh, fur, the highlights where the sun might be hitting it. Now, and this, is the, this is the blue masking over here. Blue, yeah, so those blue bits are just masking. So I threw the colors in, got in my darks, and, uh, and then decided, okay, let's take another step. This was five minutes. And then I thought, okay, we'll let this dry and see how it goes. And uh, so then I covered him with masking tape. I'm not sure if I sent that photo in. Yeah, so you're dropping some almost straight tube colors in there too, aren't you? I uh, know there's a lot of mixture. There's, um, it's alizarin <clears throat> with French Ultra and burnt sienna with alizarin okay. and some uh, cerulean and oh, I think that that maybe that. some sepia. Um, in the in the back part the yeah. the challenge for me was the wet fur like there's when the bear's in the water everything mm -hmm. above but there's that one inch of wet fur so there's this real wet part and that I thought I wasn't sure how I was gonna go about that so next was just taping him up and then throwing down a background which I wanted this to be mayfly season. So I threw some uh, uh -huh. salt water on my paper first and let it dry. And while I was taping up the, or masking off the bear with just masking tape, and then um, threw in some, uh, it's uh, French ultramarine and uh, quin gold and burnt sienna, and just put that down on the paper uh, quickly dropped in some reflection from some of the wet colors that were still there from the bear and um, and then took off the masking tape and uh, gave him a big blue nose. <laughs> so you were dropping some some clear water drops in there. And then some clear water, yeah, <laughs> on top. I just okay. wanted a very textural. I thought about painting it in the rain and then or I wasn't sure if I wanted to put in a row of trees in the far distance or because I was looking at three or four different photos and uh, decided, you know what, I like, well, I don't like mayflies, but I like that swarm, that swarm that you see when you go for a walk. I don't know if you get mayflies in Ottawa, but. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Here. And so I thought, okay, I mean, bears, you can smell bears before you can see them. So I'm sure the mayflies hover where they do so I just wanted to try something different and I was terrified of doing the splash water in the fishing bear so I thought this was my compromise uh, so Karen here you you created you know the fur look along there how did you mask that I used I didn't mask it I didn't mask it I just used when I wet the paper with water I just sort of pulled in with my fan brush um, I pulled in uh, the water into the fur just okay. a little bit. And then the back hump, um, the, the second part of the bear, the third part, I didn't pull it in there. So you can see that straight edge. And I thought, I'll just deal with that later. Okay. And then here's, here's your final piece. Oh, wow. Absolutely wonderful. Wow. I love it. Yeah. And great so I, I'm not sure, um, if this is a big piece, it's 30 inches by uh, 11. 
And um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep that back portion of the bear or not, because it has his nose landing right at the halfway point in this composition. But I was hoping because he's sort of on an angle and moving forward, I put those water rings in to make the direction. Um, so I'm hoping I can get away with it, but I'm still undecided. I might chop uh, six inches off of either side to, uh, to change that, but still thinking about it. Yeah, I like it the way it is, Karen. I think it works. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't change a thing. No. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> no, you, he's got this space to move into and you can, your eye takes him there. Yep. You could apply the rule of no rules and then it would work fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, he's so overpainted. Like, I feel like, you know, you, you can't, once you pull out the little brushes and you really can't get away with this with watercolor oil, no problem, but with watercolor, you can't just keep redoing that nose and those eyes. You end up almost burrowing in. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's okay. Nobody will notice unless you tell them. Karen, That's right. I, think, I think being doing it as a pano is extremely effective. I agree with everybody. I wouldn't chop anything on that. No. It, it, needs, been... it needs that whole area to show the movement that you obviously captured with the bear. I think it's... Yeah, don't chop. All right. Well, yeah, three seconds later, and the bear will be gone. Yeah, yeah. That's, right, yeah. that's true. <laughs> Karen, are you in a gallery? Pardon? Are you in a gallery? No, no, no. I I don't show ever. I just paint and put them under my bed. Oh no! <laughs> you know I'm the same. I've got the biggest yeah. collection of anybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would sell in instantly in any of the galleries in Bath or Kenmore. It'd, it'd be oh, gone. God, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. It would. Well, I, I'm hoping to do a few. I love bear watching and uh, I love going out west to uh, Sonora Island just to go bear watching. Uh -huh. So I'm hoping to do, you know, maybe three or four bears and put together a little collection. And, uh, yeah, and, then, and then there'll be a collection under my bed. Are you, <laughs> are you spelling K A R Y N or E N? It's, I spell it Y-N. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Karen, um, if you do a series of those, I sincerely, seriously suggest you should present them to a, a gallery out here. Because this kind of artwork, it goes like crazy out there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I've never painted to sell, so I'll have to. Listen, listen the, guy, the guy I go to, he would look at that and say, uh, you'd say, oh, five or 600. He'd say, no, no, 2,200. That's what wow. he, he'd tell you. <laughs> well, then I'll just send it to you, Brian, and you just have yourself a commission. <laughs> that's, that's what you could get it for the size and for the painting. Easy. Yeah, that's a big painting. $2,200, yeah. 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 It's a nice format. You should try this elongated format if you haven't. It's, um, it's one of my favorites. I just take a full sheet of 30 by 22 and cut it in half lengthwise. And uh, I've been painting on them for about the last maybe five or six months, and I really enjoy it. Yeah. So. so you cut it at the, at the 30 to make it a 1522 or an 11 by 30? It's 11 by 30. Okay. Yeah, it's a slice. So. And have you uh, stretched, and do you stretch the paper before you? Uh... No, I tape it to a board. I just tape it to a shelf. The 300 pound? No. It's, it's just 140. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great painting. Wow. It's gorgeous. I love it. Thank love you. It. it was fun to do, but I don't know. My husband asked me if I was going to name him. He's like, you, you should, you've spent enough time on that bear. You should probably give him a name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> Fred. Yeah. yeah. Fred the bear. Not Bruno. Not Bruno. No. Not Bruno. No. <laughs> There's an alternate, uh, Karen. What you could do is you could, for example, you could give them to me, and then I'll name them because I'll adopt them. <laughs> there you go. I just got room under his bed. I I thought you only did birds. We could paint a bird on his back, perched on <laughs> an ibis. 
Yeah, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Nice, nice job. Hey, let's move on. Kai, this is nice. Tell us about this. Oh, I took this uh, picture about uh, 10 years ago in uh, Harrington National Park. I was there, and I think it was really early in the morning. I was photographing <clears throat> ibises. If you don't know the ibis, if you see them in real life, they don't look like they are real birds, frankly. <laughs> they, look, they look like they're sort of comic birds. But um, so I, I caught this picture. It was a landscape picture. And uh, I spent an awful lot of time um, thinking about <laughs> how I was going to paint it. And the original picture, it was kind of dark. Um, but uh, so I didn't want it to be that dark um, because it was so, I think, so early in the morning. There were also some reeds in there. So I eliminated them. I changed it from a landscape to a portrait orientation. Um, and uh, I didn't, I started off by just drawing the bird. I didn't do the graph because I thought to myself, it's just a bird, it'll be really simple. So <laughs> I, I just uh, I just drew it. And um, then after thinking about it a bit, I started to paint. And uh, what else can I, I don't know if there's anything else I can tell you about it. So it's a bit different looking from the original, but I really liked the original photograph. So that's yeah. what, yeah. Nice, nice mm -hmm. guy. Very nice. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. love the cat shadow or the reflection, yeah. the reflection oh, on the water. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's what I liked as well was the, uh, the way in which it, uh, so I've drawn it pretty close to what it looked like in the, well, if not exactly like, what it looked like in the photograph. It just got distorted in a way that I thought was most interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. you can tell it's the shadow, but it's, as you say, mm -hmm. distorted beautifully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, right. If you ever get a chance to watch Ibises, they're quite a treat to watch them. You think this cannot be real, but they are. Yeah, they are. Oh. Cool, yeah, that's a really cool shadow. Or reflection, I mean, yeah, cool. Nicely done. Mm -hmm. Nicely done. Uh, Lynn wasn't able to join us today. Manju, you did yeah. this? Well, yeah, this is my effort number two because my effort number one was like painted painting by numbers. <laughs> um, I just wanted to kind of just do something that was fairly loose. And um, I don't know if I succeeded because the minute the watercolor started to run, I wanted to control it. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I, I didn't want any hard edges, but I needed some, but anyway, and I don't really do birds. So I, I think it kind of looks like a bird, but I'm not mm. sure. <laughs> I think the bad news is you've officially graduated from kindergarten. Yes. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, there you oh, go. No. No, no. Wait till you see my other one. <laughs> that, that's a lovely, um, that's a lovely reflection in colors. Oh, and colors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, um, you're the you know we were talking earlier about letting go and letting it go. Yeah. You're, you're getting more of the feel for that all the time. It's mm -hmm. coming along. Oh, good. good. Yeah. And I don't know what how intense your blues were when you dropped them in. I'm guessing it probably dried. A little lighter than what you thought, huh? Yeah, it did. And, and then I kind of left it like that because I didn't want um, kind of... You don't want to start messing with these edges. The values to be the same either. Yeah. It looked like a cloudy sky. <laughs> yeah. Well, nicely done, Maju. Uh, your drawing is excellent. When you say you wonder if it looks like a bird, that's, that's, <laughs> perfect. that's perfect. Well, I, I my brother-in-law is a very famous wildlife artist, so... I don't do birds because um, he's, he's so amazing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't want you don't want to hold stuff up in front of someone who's the, the so expert. This is my paint by numbers. I thought, oh, it, I should try and find something simple, and this was my idea of simple until until I tried to paint it, um, <laughs> which is uh, there's so many colors and the feathers are all iridescent. But uh, I had a hard time with it because, yeah. you know, if you go to Mud Lake, they're just hanging out and, you know, you look at them and you see how beautiful they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
but it's kind of hard to paint them because I ended up making it look very flat. Mm -hmm. I should have put this yeah. in there beside it. You know, but really, no, you've done a nice job of taking what's there and reproducing it. That's You've done well with that. Wood ducks are very plastic looking. They are, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. yeah. This was my idea of simple. <laughs> yeah. You know, Manju, if I were to offer any thought. Yes, it, please. It's, I think you've done great with the, with the little duck. Um, uh, um, it looks like you were trying to um, be a little bit more controlling in the background, in the, in the wash. Yeah, the two colors threw me off, so I didn't really know what to do. And I tried to scrub the paint off and put some more on. So it's just, um, maybe I can just crop the whole thing all together so not much of the background shows. Yeah, because your duck's fine. But, but yeah, if back to what we were talking about washes, you know, if you had a, if you had a uh, nice and wet, let it soak into the paper and then started to lay some color in, and then let go, you know, and, and not be trying to create some of these create these lines, but actually let the paint do its own thing. Yeah, this one, I, uh, the other one I did, I put wet, uh, like I washed the, I wetted the back. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little bit easier to use. This one, I was trying to just do, uh, you know, I wetted the paper on only on the front, but it dried really fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you try try um, that idea of taking your brush with the loaded water bead at the top. Okay. And just you know working your way down with making sure that that bead stays nice and wet as you lay the paint in. Okay. With a wash and just see if you see what you like about it because you'll find it it'll give you a nice even uh, wash with nice kind of distribution. Try that and just you know do a couple exercises with that just see what you think of that. Okay, uh, I'll do that. Thank you. Because okay. your duck is fine. I think your duck's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Looking at the original, you know, I mean, oops, oops. You know, I mean, you've you've done a great job with the duck. It's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nice. Nice. Thank you. And uh, Pauline, I love your studies. These are fun. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I just uh, tried to put more texture in my sketch this time, hmm. and to learn more about how because it's the bird is so dark. It was I was trying to figure out how I would kind of get some of those lines in there. Anyways, um, and then just trying to also figure out what blue to use, uh, which blues to use, I guess. Yeah, yeah. This was fun the way you uh, played with that, and then here's your final piece. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Gorgeous. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just, uh, with this one, I got carried away a little bit with the water, but anyways, he's, uh, it's a picture that my son took when he was in Victoria, and um, I have different poses of him. So I've painted him once before, but yeah. in a different pose, slightly different pose. Um, but I really like how his head is bent down on this one and, and he's got this coy, this cute little look on his face. So that's kind of what I was looking for. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. I like your uh, playing with lots of color in there too. That's nice. Well, thank you. If yeah. you, if you uh, give titles to your paintings, you should call this one. <laughs> call them what? Come hither. <laughs> <laughs> Very I'm coy. Yeah. I don't I didn't hear what you said. Sorry. Come hither. Come hither. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so Pauline, do you, did you do that with just using three colors again? Um, so with this one, I it was definitely blue, red, and yellow, always starting off with uh, primary colors. And um, I did go into the deeper color with indigo um, to get that uh, contrast on, on, on the blues at the bottom where it needed to be very dark. And um, yeah, like that's pretty much it. Hmm. 
Mm, cool. cool. And did you, did you mask up your uh, whites? The area that I masked was that line beside his beak. Um, I did mask the one line. The other one on the left, I used a little bit of white, um, sort of fluid, white fluid. The uh, Some of the dots are added with white fluid at the end. And uh, the water, I did do some masking there also with masking fluid. Cool. Oh, nice job. Thank you. So well done, everybody. So. Um, Next week, uh, come up with a flying, you can even throw a flying squirrel or, or <laughs> <laughs> a cat leaping through the air or something, but something in flight. <laughs> and we'll, we'll see how you do with flight, okay? Just if I could make one quick announcement. There's uh, Solovyev is full, Sherry Blokov is full. There are a few spots left in uh, Rita Sabler. There's a few spots left in the Ian Stewart workshop. And then there's Brian Turner's workshop and there's room in Brian Turner's workshop, the three day workshop when Brian is coming to town. So if that, if you haven't already registered in one of those and are interested, then please get a hold of the registrar and <laughs> send in your request. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stay on with Brian for a couple of minutes and talk about some business.